Thank you so much, Carmel, for that wonderful introduction. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yep. Wonderful. Firstly, I'd just like to say how thrilled I was to be asked to speak to you on this most auspicious occasion. Professor Simpson, Jane, if I, if I may. It's so wonderful to see you and David and so many familiar faces here today. Congratulations on a stellar career. I hope you'll forgive me for having my candidature terminated so prematurely. I'd also like to acknowledge not only Jane, but so, so many of the linguists here in the room, many of your students have gone on to have illustrious careers here at Flexicon and other tech companies in Silicon Valley. And linguistics, of course, is our bread and butter. And we're always keen to provide opportunities for, uh, for high quality graduates. In fact, uh, Fred Finkelstein and Rance Rasmussen are working for us, both of whom used to be in the transient building at the University of Sydney. Fred, of course, is on our board of directors while Rance heads up the uh, testing laboratories and we'll be hearing from Rance rather shortly. Okay, so have you ever felt that you wanted to say something but the words you were after just aren't there? Or, or perhaps sometimes that item is at the tip of your tongue, but you just can't retrieve it. Alternatively, you might be trying to write something, but even visiting a thesaurus doesn't really help, help you to fill that lexical gap that uh, you seem to have encountered. Well, here at Flexicon, we're developing technical solutions that should help to ensure that lexical deficits are a thing of the past. So for some time now, work has been proceeding on, on bringing to perfection the crudely conceived idea of a morpholoptic parser that would not only provide lexical override function for meromorphic stem detractors, but it will also be capable of syncretizing multi-exponent panambulators. Such an instrument is Flexicon's morphoencabulator. Basically, the only new principle involved is, in, is that instead of the optimal morphomic density being derived from the syntagmatic and paradigmatic properties of the lexico syntax, it's generated by the modial interaction of morphosolapsis and phonetic deflection. The initial prototype had a base plate, pre ungulated flexitate encased within a spe specious logarithmic housing in such a way that the two Simpson bearings were in a line to the velocimetric core. The latter consisted of six duplometric fuzzle tops so fitted to the ambicrucial morphlactic input processor such that spline gurgling was effectively <laughs> The main processor is of the regular I-core alpha type, placed in the demi-clovoid slots, gouged into the base plate of the encabulator housing, every seventh inducer being connected by a non-reversible tremi pipe to the heatsink. Because the differential girdle spring fleens at about 25,000 RPM, heat sinking is, heat sinking is managed by hydrocoptic fans fitted onto the up end of the panambulator. The morphoencabulator has now reached a high level of development and has been successfully used in the operation of paraphilinians. Moreover, when lexification is required, it may be employed in conjunction with a gland reciprocation ding alarm to reduce sinusoidal defrimulation. Okay. So I realise that I'm mostly addressing a room full of linguists and that you might not be all that convinced by all these big words or that perhaps you're generally underwhelmed by the technological bells and whistles. And for the next part of the presentation, I'm going to ground these developments within morphological theory. Bear with me while I share my screen. Okay. Is that oh, whoopsie daisy? All right. Can you see are you seeing that? 
Okay. Um, all right, sorry, I'm just... Okay. <laughs> until recently, uh, until recently, uh, development, developmental progression in morphoencabulation had been largely hamstrung by, an over, by a dogged over-reliance on antiquated notions like the morphine. And as you all know, morphine-based accounts uh, of derivation rest on idealized one-to-one form-to-meaning mappings, which have difficulty accounting for such things as stem alternations, zero morphs, empty morphs, cumulative exponents, all of which sort of pose problems for an item and arrangement mod model of derivation. Consider the following here, okay? So we've got forget, forgettable, for unforgettable, et cetera, imagine, imaginable, unimaginable. Then we've got flap and unflappable, but flappable itself is sort of a little bit marginal, okay? So a more femic based account would struggle to explain why unflappable is a reasonable word while flappable sounds kind of odd. Um, furthermore, the historical evidence suggests that the adjective unflappable uh, can't possibly have been built up by simply adding derivational morphemes one after the other, um, with the meaning sort of not, not uh, subject to nervous to nervous excitement or anxiety, the OED suggests unflappable first appeared in 1959 uh, with reference to the then British Prime Minister, Harold Macmillan. Yet flappable appears in the OED, doesn't appear in the OED at all. And uh, Wiktionary lists it as a back formation from unflappable. Um, earlier attestations of flappable are very rare and they mostly relate to sort of crazy devices that we're, Wings, wings were flat. Um, with the sense, you know, like uh, a state of worry or agitation uh, for flap, with, from which unflappable is clearly derived, uh, is a noun. So um, it's not really clear how, uh, so which it doesn't really form a suitable base for the de verbalizer unflappable. Uh, so while unflappable is clearly derived from flap, uh, the route from unflap to flappable did obviously didn't really transpire by the addition of a morpheme um to this to this stem, and this was not derived from um, uh, the, a ball from the noun flap. So we need another type of explanation. Okay, so these sorts of issues are uh, less of a problem for word and paradigm approaches to morphology as they're less closely wedded to matching forms to meanings. And the theoretical underpinnings of the morpho-encabulator lie in an offshoot of uh, construction grammar known as construction morphology, particularly the variety proposed by Chedek Bui, okay? Um, so in construction morphology, we might have two word schemas like this, a ball able to be verbed and un, like not, whatever the adjective root is, from which we can have a kind of unified schema that sort of conflates these two, okay? So, so here's our unified schema built up from these other ones, uh, okay? Um, you know, so far so good, but what Bowie proposes uh, is that these unified word schemas need un needn't take only bona fide lexical entries as input for the schemas, they can be built up from possible words. And if possible words can be permitted as intermediate steps, then unflappable needn't rest on the existence of flappable as an actual word, as long as it serves as a possible word. Excuse me. So if we can use, if we can, oh, hang on, let me give you a few examples from, from of buoys. Here's some, uh, some examples from Dutch where we've got uh, these negated on adjectives uh, built up from these verbs. These are a couple of the examples here. But um, interestingly enough, um, these negated versions 
whilst these are you know legitimate words these some of these de-verbal adjectives in the middle uh, seem to be um, a little bit marginal they they're certainly feasible but uh, anyway these these are the kinds of uh, composite types of schemas that Bowie proposes to account for uh, the derivation from from these where where these things here exist as, as possible words. So if we can unify word schemas and allow complex possible words as intermediate steps, then morphological complexity needn't be built up componentially from components that are meaningful all the way along the line. There, well, there we go. So if we give you an Let's have an example here. So we can derive, if you like, encapsulate from capsule uh, with our with these sort of you know simple schemas that are unified there, and um, and and that's kind of handy because uh, sorry, that's kind of handy because it doesn't really uh, matter whether capsulate is, is a, a reasonable word, it's, a, it's a, as long as it lists as a possible word. And we can do the same thing uh, in that we can, in, we can have encabulate can be derived from cabula via, via cabulate. Um, so note that this doesn't really, this doesn't really require that capsulate be a prop, prop actual word, only a possible word. And if we can do that, then we can use the same schema for, uh, we, can, we, can add, we can add a few other extra little derivations, okay? I, turn it into eta, we can add morpho, okay? Which is concerned with form. Uh, so this, is, this will then give us a unified schema which gives us the construction morpho, which is the one we use for morpho and cabulator. Where morpho and cabulator is built up through unified word schemas from the root cabula. You might be asking whether cabula is a bona fide root. And the point is that it doesn't need to be. These word schemas uh, seem to be able to accept a variety of possible roots. And here at Flexicon, we've subjected these schemas to a whole barrage of testing from a large range of languages with different typological profiles. And as well as genuine bona fide roots, unified word schemas will also accept quasi roots, faux roots, and even dud roots. <laughs> But as well as all the root and stem technologies, these word schemas will also account for other types of liminal morphology, such as affixoids, as well as types of morph morphosyntactic phenomena. So at Flexicon, we've, in, we've instigated extensive field tests on Buckenagel's demiclitics, and the result has been most encouraging. Okay, so I will stop sharing my slides now. And where we're all right. Okay. Well, now that you understand the theoretical principles underpinning the morpho encabulator, I'm now going to pass you on to our lead technician, Rance Rasmussen, who will demonstrate some of the functionality of the morpho encabulator. Uh, bear, bear with me a moment while I well, I patch you through. <laughs> Thanks, Sid. And hello. Congratulations on your retirement. I'm glad you're, I'm, I'm sorry I'm not able to, well, I'm glad I'm able to join you, even if only rather briefly. Well, now that you know a bit about how the Morpho encabulator works, let's have a look at some of its functionality calibration and operation. And for the purpose of obscurity, I've, um, I've removed the casing and exposed the heart of the morphone encabulator, the morphoselactic modial interactor. Both morphoselapsis and phrenastic deflection are calibrated with controlling software that we call SEQR, the, the SECA engine schematic expansion of quantized roots. 
Secker basically takes a bi-pronged approach that draws on the flexibility of macroplastic plastic <laughs> and the rigidity of schematographic doculexy. You can see on the base of the unit that there are a range of inputs, including HDMI, USB 3, and an SD card slot. But it also has Bluetooth connectivity, which allows you to connect to a range of visualizers, including these augmented reality smart glasses. <laughs> okay, so let's give this, give it, give it a bit of a bash, shall we? We begin the calibration by selecting language, genre type, schematic output limiter, phonactic displacement, phonotactic displacement, and morphone cabulator run test. Connect the lexometric sensors to the aft end of the MOXIE interrupter using special adapter NFW, making sure that the osmolality of the multi-exponent penambulators is not extrapolated. Run tests output will be displayed in secret code on, on the morphone cabulator display or on whichever display you've interfaced with. It's a simple head code, anyone can catch it. <laughs> Use the Geiger scale on the encabulator display to measure the wrench and output of the phonactic deflection flux muster. If it's above 10 syllabifications per lexeme, reset the penambulators to increase phonotactic displacement. If it's less than 10 syllabifications per le lexeme, then phonactic displaction should be within the specified tolerance limits for high quality multilateral <laughs> Be sure to watch out for sigmoid rumbling below the belt line, which the user might experience as a burping or hiccuping noise. It's relatively harmless, but it can induce mild discomfort for the user. To service this fault, Refer to Morphone Cabulator Diagnostic Procedures Manual, perform test ME10, and recalibrate according to the described troubleshooting procedure. Okay, well, thank you very much, Jane. And from now, I'm just going to pass you back to, to Stig for a moment. Uh, please bear with me a minute. I'll catch you back through to Stig. Okay, thanks, Rance. There you have it. At least that's the story so far. We're in advanced stages of testing in a range of languages, including Georgian, Straits Salic, and West Greenlandic. And the feedback we've received from speakers of these languages has been most enthusiastic. From what you've seen, the Geiger scale uh, allows you to constrain schematic expansion to whatever limit is appropriate for language and genre type. If the Execa engine were, were to operate without such constraints, the result would be unbridled jargomancy. Basically, it to eliminate cranberylic morphologers. <laughs> it's a bright future for the morphone cabulator. Perhaps the most exciting application with this technology is that the lexical override function as applied to meromorphic stem detractors helps combat anomia, which is a symptom experienced by patients with certain forms of uh, aphasia and various neurogenerative diseases like dementia. Randomized trials are underway on a, of our new lexometric implant technology, uh, which um, allows us to interface directly with the left inferior frontal gyrus and as well as those portions of the temporal and parietal lobes that mediate lexical access. Well, there you, there you have it. Um, I think I'll leave it at there, that for now. Um, I'd just like to say a final word to Professor Simpson. Um, I'm very sorry that I was um, not really able to see my uh, PhD candidature uh, through to its completion. But I do hope that uh, th these particular devices will, in some sense, serve as the sort of morphologic causes uh, that I was to, going to try to prepare for Walbury. In fact, I think it may well work quite well for <laughs> different type of architecture. Thank you very much.